Remember what I said to you guys? Let me do the introductions. Please. Sure. Go right ahead. Good evening. My name is Stephen Rabinowitz, and I'm the Jake Peralta of uh, the Sports Line. So with me is the Captain Raymond Holtz of this ship, Jake Kaplan, and the Charles, Charles Boyle to my Jake Anthony Strait. Let's have a feast of sports. Finally, this is the on the sports lines Yum Kippur edition and, and the Night Nine edition that I threw. And we, we add some stuff over here. All right, Yankees, Mets, Jets, Giants—they're all on the docket this week. But guys, let's leave the paper bags alone and not put them over our head. Let's have serious discussions on this show, okay? Okay. If you insist, Rabbi. Right. Yeah, right. I, guess. I guess. All right, we'll start. We'll start with baseball, Scully and Hitchcock, the Yankees and the Mets. The Yankees are in a battle with the Boston Red Sox and the Toronto Blue Jays to see who's going to be in the wild card game, fighting for a one game playoff. Anyway, after a 13 game winning streak, their longest in many, 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 many years, the Yankees have come down to earth in a big way. And now a division title is very out of the question from a team that was supposed to be struggling all year. Right, Jay, in Tampa Bay? I'm always going to call you out for that because I knew it was going to happen. You're always the Nancy negative, man. Uh, you you, you said Nancy it. Negative. You said it. I knew they were going to be good, and they definitely were. Playoff existence is on the line. Jay, what's the fix as the Yankees just lost again tonight? Uh, here, here's the thing, you know. Back in the day, this was once the strength of the team, but the back of the Yankees bullpen is now as inconsistent as the rotation other than Garrett Cole and the lineup other than Aaron Judge. I mean, Aroldis Chapman has used to be a lights-out closer, lost the job for a while this season. His fastball seems to have lost a little of that Cuban missile zip. Zach Britton was about as locked down an eighth inning setup man, backup closer as you could want, but he freely admitted he's been off his game this season when he's actually been available, which hasn't been much. And now he's out for the year along with offseason acquisition, Darren O'Day, who is expected to handle some of the late inning load. Chad Green has been good as, as good as you'd want for a reliever that you can deploy in any high leverage situation. He even stepped in as the closer for a stretch, but he has been overused and it's affecting his performance. Manager Aaron Boone has admitted that Green's usage has been unfair this season. His 75 plus innings pitch is the most among MLB relievers and he's only pitched more than two innings four times. It's a problem for the Yankees that one of their most needed relief pitchers is fatigued and gassed while they're playing some of their most crucial games of the season. You add in jack-of-all-trades reliever Jonathan Lewisaga, who, like Green, has been great in all situations. He's among the MLB leaders in medium or high leverage innings, becoming the latest reliever to land on the I.L. Good yeah, to know. continue going on. Continue Due to a straight rotator cuff. And the Yankees have a pen problem as they come down this stretch with a playoff spot hanging in the balance. It's kind of forced Boone to add some surprising addition to the reliever, reliever circle of trust this season. He's given pitchers such as Wandy Peralta, Albert Abreu, and Clay Holmes larger responsibility in recent weeks. They've done the best they can, but if Lewisig is done for the season, he's out until 926 at the earliest. If Green can't find his second winner, or is it third at this point? And if Chapman can't back, get back to owning the ninth inning consistently, then the Yankees are going to need better, deeper outings from their starting rotation beyond Cole. Nestor Cortez allowing only one run on three hits over six and a third with 11 strikeouts Wednesday night in the win over the Orioles was huge. And they're going to need their entire offense, not just judge with a sprinkling of Stanton to put up more games with crooked numbers. Yankees are tied with Boston and, and Toronto for both AL wildcard spots. And they have a pair of winnable series coming up in a six game homestand against Cleveland and Texas losing tonight in to Baltimore in extras doesn't help with that, but they need to take advantage of these two series by winning games that don't tax the bullpen because after that guys, it's nothing but the Red Sox, the Jays and the Rays to close the season. October baseball is on the line fellas and the Yankees last line of defense needs to be in October form. They have a shot of playing deeper into that month. Anthony. As we, by the yeah. way, talk about the Yankees' little 
uh, struggles lately, and if you might have heard this in the middle, I hit the record button a little too late, but you know, that's just the deal with this show. So, Anthony, let's talk about the Yankee struggles. Ah, uh, the beauty of live TV, isn't it? Oh, um, uh, yeah. It, what, yeah, what has a name that the Yankees need to take advantage of what they have right now, and that is the soft portion of their September schedule. Uh, you think about this, coming into this uh, four-game set against the Baltimore Orioles, a team the Yankees routinely have traditionally played very well against. They had just won two of their last 10 games. And this is following a 13 game winning streak. Now, keep in mind, the Orioles, the Orioles literally started the Yankees down with spiral a month ago after that winning streak, uh, taking that series in Yankee Stadium. So the Yankees need to need to win the games they have to win before that motorist roll uh final nine game nine ten game stretch against the the rest the main of the American League East. They take the three out of four to Baltimore. That's the start. Now you look at the, the rest of their schedule. They have uh three games uh, at home against Cleveland. Um and the Texas Rangers after that, two of the worst teams in the American League, respectively. They have the Yankees have to win their games because when you look at as Jay mentioned who they finished the season against, they haven't played well against the Red Sox this year. They're just six and ten overall against Boston, and they have to go to Fenway for that series. Then they have to go to Toronto for the first time since 2019. And the Blue Jays have played very, very well in the last month and a half of the year. Think about this. It was over 30 games, 30 days ago, they were nine and a half games out. And they have just went on a tour stretch to get themselves back into the chase of the wild card. Then they end the season against the Rays, a team the Yankees, for whatever reason, have literally struggled with down the stretch, including the postseason last year. They will have very little to play for, most likely, which will be a huge And that And that could be an advantage for the Yankees. The Rays will be kind of playing to playing to rest. They have the division locked up. They know they will have – a division series matchup, but then again, it's a division a division opponent. It is the Yankees, so don't be surprised if the Tampa Bay Rays do decide to go all out in an effort to possibly stick it to the Yankees again, and instead of knocking them out of the postseason, just keep them out of the postseason altogether. Look, the Yankees as a whole are a dangerous team if they get into the playoffs. And if you're Tampa and you're looking at and you're looking at the best record overall in the American League. And a chance to possibly play the Yankees in round one in the division series. What better way to avoid that trouble by keeping them out all together in that final weekend stretch? So look, the Yankees right now, they they they, they all took a great start. Take three or four from Baltimore. I feel like they have to sweep um the next the next series in Cleveland uh, at home in Yankee Stadium. Fan grass is predicted it's gonna take at least 12 more victory, 12 wins. The rest of the way for the Yankees between now and the end of the season, 92, 90 to 92 wins. They're pretty much going to wrap up that uh, one of the two wild cards in the American League. So the Yankees, that is 90 wins at least is the the is the the level or the ceiling they have to get to to ensure themselves at least playing one more game in October. Did you just say that you mean you think they need to go 12 and three to get themselves a spot? Well, you, well, look at it like this. The Jays are playing like they a have team three. that doesn't refuse, uh, that refuse to lose. And the Red they Sox have been cut. You can, you, you, the thing, hey, look. 12 and 3, to, Anthony? Yeah. Yeah, look, that's the anatomy of a Met fan that needs the Yankees out. I'm thinking more well, like well, here's the thing. 10 and 5, here's... 9 and 6, and get the right wins over the Blue Jays and the Red Sox. Okay. Yeah, hey, look, cutting the best... you off right, cutting <laughs> you off right there, thinking your yeah, team needs to go 12 and 3 when there's still time for I, was, I said 12 wins. I didn't There's say 12 and 3 the rest of the way. I said 12 more wins. And show some. Um, you said 12 wins. They have 15 games. If you do the math correctly, that's 12 and 3. Okay. Moving on to Joey Gallo, who is finally actually hitting a big number. 199. That's embarrassing for a player who was built to get some I know you know what you're getting with him he leads the majors in both walks and strikeouts and 106 walks and 195 strikeouts and he can hit a ball any time out of the ballpark however he only has eight home runs as a Yankee that's not what you expect for somebody who has a porch that basically says hit a home run over here for me 
And Jay just talked about it. The inconsistency of this lineup. Rizzo hasn't done his job. Glaber has not really done his job. For God's sakes, the guy who gets the biggest hits of clutch spots is Brett Gardner, who is 51 years old on this team, but is still one of the most reliable Yankees out there. This hey, team, hey, 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 he's, he, he's not that old, man. No, he's not. But I'm just saying, compared to the youth movement of this team, a team that has a lot of players in their prime. Yes, compared to the youth all... movement, he's Methuselah. Yes, I get it. Yeah, he is definitely Methuselah, but he's still – you need to have every... You need to have players who know how to hit in big spots. And they did that in the 13-game winning streak. And now that the pressure is getting to them, I don't know what's happening. The one thing I like, and something that happened yesterday when uh, – they went to Chapman and for a third consecutive day in the ninth inning. Aaron Boone basically admitted that these games are not the same from September in, that they were in April. A lot of managers say, I'll play a game the same way. He's not BSing. And I, I don't know what to expect from this team in the last two and a half weeks. However, even if this team sneaks in to wildcard position, I don't trust this team against Toronto or Boston in the one-game playoff. And I certainly – don't trust this team in a matchup against Tampa Bay or Houston, which is who they would likely get in an ALDS. The Yankees Agreed. were <clears throat> built to win, and right now they're just built to survive. And that's not really the way that it should be. To All clarify right. my point, the Yankees see the 12 wins. They got they got three out of four from Baltimore, so they need at least nine more the rest of the way. To okay, least- 12 wins going in. That's yeah. still nine and, nine and six is more doable. Okay. So moving on from that. Anyway, the Mets, they're terrible. I can't make a joke. What can I say? They're pretty much out of this thing. They are. They were five games out of the wild card going into yesterday. They're worse now. And this is a team that pretty much gets up for the Yankees just as much as the 9-9 gets up for the 7-4 for, in Brooklyn. Now, let's just say... The Yankees just look like crap against everyone else. Their owner is on Twitter more than Donald Trump was ever on Twitter in his heyday. Fights with people on nonstop. There's a ton of fixes that are needed. This team is probably not going to make the playoffs. Anthony, you saw them lose last night. They just got swept by the Cardinals. The funeral procession has already happened, seemingly. So, Anthony, think of one little fix for us, please. Well, one of the fixes they needed to absolutely needed to do, and and, I, and you mentioned I was at City Field and wearing all black, which seems to be uh, pretty ironic for the occasion because the Yankees, I mean the the Mets, I should say, the Mets can't hit, and that's just pretty much what it is. They they they're just not able to get hits in uh, situational baseball. The Yan- the Mets. Once the uh, well, they they play the Yankees well for whatever reason, but we can't play them once or two uh, uh, times a season. But with the Mets, there's, the, the situation of baseball is probably among the worst teams in baseball right now. You think about this, all year long they've been, they, they've been struggling. The second game of this uh, three-game set against the Cardinals, they had a chance to win the game in extra innings after Javi Baez tied the game in the bottom of the ninth, and they had to a double play, whereas Pilar, for whatever reason, Stops in the middle of running from home. Now, granted, Paul Goldschmidt did a, made a great play. He's a gold glover. But if you're going to run on contact, you just got to keep going, whether you're going to get thrown out or not. And he stops halfway, gets caught in the rundown. The, uh, the Mets score an opportunity. The Cardinals bust the game open in the very next half inning. And going back to the game I was at 24 hours ago, the Mets went one for 14 with runners to scoring position. Uh, Peter Alonso coming into this in the into the three game sets series with a was in a, a 0 for 19 slump, hit a home run, but he's what one for his last 23. The, I mean, look at this the, the numbers the Mets have a 227 batting average and a 685 on on place slugging percentage in situations, uh, and in situ- when it comes to situation baseball, when it comes to runners in scoring position, they're even worse, they'll be below 200. And with runners on first and third, they're just barely above the Mendoza line. So overall, all season long, this team has not been able to get that key hit when they needed an opportunity, when a chance to get back to the game, whether it's a chance to win a game, a chance to pad on a lead. 
it has been it's been just a a, a sh- just a, a, a microcosm of the mess. This shit show, show. Shit yeah. show is, perfect, is, is just I, a trying, perfect yeah, way to I, say I'm it. I'm trying to clean my language up, but it is. But by nope, the way, you can I, do it right now. Yeah. But yeah, for but it is it is worth mentioning that the mess lineup struggles at least for uh, doing this stretch. Really, did start with Brandon Nemo being out of the lineup. He was kind of the the spark plug. The, uh, that kind of started the, the, the Mets somewhat second half resurgence when they had the four and a half game lead coming into the month of August. And since August, folks, they're 16 and 27. They're batting 230 as a team. Um, they've lost, think about this 10 of the last 12 game losses have been by one run. One run. They've lost 14 one run games since August, folks. That is just un believable how bad this team can struggle. We talk about the Yankees when offensively when one guy struggles, it seems like it's a trickle down effect. The Mets have been struggling all season long and they got by with their pitching in, in the first half. They got by with their bullpen kind of playing better than expectations but at the end of the day when you can't hit when, the, when it comes down to it it's going to cost you and, and the Mets have kind of Played themselves out of the postseason, out of a playoff chase because of the inability to te- to score runs when they and to get that big hit when they need it the most. Yeah, uh, I I I don't know what's wrong with it. I think right now the Mets are just one of those organizations that are in that hellhole zone, really a zone where you can try to get as many people as you want in free agency, but. As he can say, and I hate to say it, you can put a pig on a, a dress on a pig, but it's still a pig. Right now, the Yankees are just, I mean, the Mets are just, they're a struggle. They're just a huge struggle. Francisco Lindor did a very good job in the Subway Series, hitting three home runs in that last game after all of the pitch stealing controversy from that second game. I think the Yankees and the Mets mm-hmm. are just hated each other so much and they're so microcosm of each are such microcosms of each other this year that I think this was just a boiling point because they have both been massive major disappointments in 2021 and I think just Lindor's having a bad season in himself at 228 17 52 I was going to say he needs to produce at the end of the year to see what you have next year but he's going to be tied to your organization for a very very long time We'll see what he has to what he has to do. He again, you're not getting rid of him, but Lindor can at least get a nice little tear going in the end of the season to prove he's it's not about him at all. I do want to talk about Steve Cohen though, and I want to talk about there was this report that came out earlier today that basically said that he was going on Twitter because someone anonymously said the team is not worth as much this year as they were last year. They took a major decline on value and basically challenged his followers to find the source to get tickets to sitting to him next to a game. And I'm going to say this to Anthony as a Met fan, and I'm going to say this as a presidential thing. Are you better off this year than you were last with the Will Ponds? Uh, well, you got to think about this last 2020. I, I don't want to count that because of the pan, it was the pandemic. Okay. Then that, are you better but, off two years uh, ago? Yes, they are. Come on. Uh, I don't know, though. I don't know. As an organization, I would say yes, as far as front office. On the field, pretty much they're the oh, same team. They're, they're the it's same team. Much the they same have the talent. The, the talent is down, but it hasn't come together. And, and, <laughs> and it's pretty much, um, like I said, Lindor, Lindor Sunday night against the Yankees, great moment, but it's not going to erase the fact that he's had a terrible full season in New York. It's... Um, Javi Baez was, has, has had his nice little moments, but who knows if he'll be back. There's a lot of question marks going into the offseason with this Met team, and it's going to be um, it's going to be interesting to see what Cohen and what the front office does. By the way, the front office who don't have a, a general manager right now mm. um, on nope. top of that. And so they probably gonna, are going to need to get somebody this offseason. That's going to be you know, there's a guy priority named, number one. Well, there's a guy named Epstein that I would think will – probably be on, on line number one if Cohen gets, gets his way. But um, like I said, the mess right now, they're, they're still the same team. And they're, they're still a lot, the same team with a lot of question marks. I think two years ago, 
they had a little more upside and optimism. But now when you look at the offseason and the guys that they can potentially lose through the free agency, um, like I said, it's going to be a, it's a lot of question marks with this team. And the way they're finishing down the stretch is not making things any easier. Jay, what do you think about this mess right now with this team? The, the thing that I'm I'm looking at, at what they do, and to me, this will say a lot about how they feel about their dwindling playoff chances. I think uh, they're they're below five percent at the moment. You know, uh, about their willingness to risk potential short term gain for uh, you know long term risk um, is how they're going to handle Jacob Degrom now. Everybody knows that, you know, he got shut down in July with what turned out to be a sprain of his UCL. And the Mets didn't let anybody know that was the reason until the 7th of September after referring to it as right elbow inflammation when he went on the 60-day DL on July 30. Now, that usually means Tommy John surgery and, you know, the two-time NL Cy Young Award winner being out for the remainder of the season and likely most of 2022. However, as Mets President Sandy Alderson said um, earlier, uh, in the month, quote, a sprain is the lowest grade partial tear, if you will. So at this point, the sprain has resolved itself. The elbow is at this point perfectly intact based on the MRIs and our clinical evaluation through the doctors. And with that, it now seems that DeGrom could possibly return before the season ends, possibly giving the Mets playoff hopes at five and a half back of Atlanta in the East, four and a half games back of San Diego for the second wildcard spot, you know, a potential jolt. He's been working to return. He's been throwing since the August, end of August when an MRI um, cleared him to do so. Mets have been monitoring his progression with a possible return to mind. He threw 10 pitches off a mound earlier this week. First bullpen work since July when he was shut down. Next step, another light bullpen session later in the week, increasing the intensity of those sessions, throwing live batting practice, and then possibly going on a rehab assignment before, you know, with an eye on returning to the active roster. But what would that mean? Back to starting rotation for a couple of three starts, at most on a pitch count, working out of the bullpen for an inning or two here or there so they could use him multiple times a week. I mean, look, we all know the numbers he was putting up before he went down, 7-2 and two in 15 starts, 108 ERA in 92 innings, a whip of 0 0.554, fielding independent pitching. I know that's Rabbi's one of his favorite stats of 1.23, a 14.3 strikeouts per nine rate, and a strikeouts to walk ratio of 13.27 i mean we were making bob gibson 1968 comparison and comparisons and they were legit can the mets honestly expect that same level of dominance after degrom's been out for so long you know and to me like i said how do they weigh the long-term risk for 2022 and beyond against any potential short-term rewards for the stretch run of this season is the juice really worth the squeeze on this we're, we're, we're gonna find out i guess i don't know i mean me personally I don't think so. I don't think it's nice to see him progressing. And, you know, the thought that he could potentially be healthy in time for, you know, training camp 2022 and pick up where he left off. I don't know that it makes any sense to, for them to try and run him out here the last week, 10 days of, uh, uh, you know, two weeks of the season. Uh, I don't know. To me, the juice ain't worth the squeeze, but that's me. These guys, who knows the way this front office has been making decisions of late. Uh, I'm going to answer with you for you and an emphatic answer. No. Anyway, <laughs> it's it's not. This is not a team that no. needs in any way, shape, or form to risk any further injury with this rotation. That rotation <laughs> needs to continue to be their strong suit with or without Marcus Stroman next year. And I'm going to say right now, the way they're going, it's probably going to be without because Stroman's going to want to go for a team that has better chance of winning, even if those pockets are yeah. left out. And what's the funny part is all this is going on on a week well, the Once Upon a Time in Queens documentary on the 1986 Mets, Mets uh, debuts on ESPN. Obviously, in, uh, the, the 86 Mets are still the darlings to Mets fans everywhere. And then the current team comes out and gets swept yeah. by a Cardo team that is playing very well as of late. Agreed. Um, yeah, they, that, that, they just make... need, yeah, Anthony, they just need to adjust it. The, the Queens is burning. That's pretty much the best way of putting it right now. Yeah. That's pretty much the best way of putting it right let's now. Talk some All right, guys. Football. Now let's move to the thing that moved. Yes, let's talk some football. Uh, now the thing that moved Brooklyn 99's finale up an hour. God damn it. The Giants. Let's kind of look at this game right now. It's at halftime. Washington is up 14 to 10. Hey, if you're going to play your required Thursday game, get it out of the way in week two. Let's start Amen. with some observations, starting with Jay. 
<laughs> well, I mean, you guys know that, like, I always, you know, I'm watching, I'm watching the quarterback, and you know, we talked at, you know, at length about Daniel Jones and what this season, you know, how important it is for him. And I was looking at some things early on, um, and I was also looking at how Jason Garrett would potentially change any play calling um, from Sunday to tonight. I mean, the first drive in the first quarter, they came out up tempo, played no huddle. They need had a good mix of running and passing. I think they need to do a lot more of this. And unfortunately, Garrett seems to start that way, but then he pulls back. Jones found four different receivers on that drive. They, you know, had an inconsistent stretch in the run zone. Jones took a tack, took a sack that roughened the penalty pass around Chase Young on third and 12 held big. Um, Jones scoring on the, you know, design quarterback draw on that first drive. Nice way to end it. A great first drive for Danny. Four for four, 45 yards, three carries, 23 yards, accounting for 68 of the 79 on the drive. Um, nice to see Saquon break out in his, you know, in that second drive, 41 yards. But again, uh, you know, Jason Garrett, true to form, right after that big run, he goes to trickeration, attempts an end around to CJ Board for six yards. I'm like, why? You know, I mean, we talked, uh, you know, offline before we came on about that, you know, delay a game t- on third and two. Jones gets sacked on the next play. Everyone gets in his face. Protection totally breaks down. No one, you know, they, they, they talk to him, you know, Troy Aikman talking about him having to get the ball out of his hands faster. I rewound the, the game and I'm looking downfield. All of his receivers were covered at that point when they, when the, you know, the, the dam broke. So um, sucks that it pushed him out of field goal range, you know, and again, the thing I was noticing, not much in the way of pre-snap motion or movement. You know, um, you know, Jones overthrows Galladay on, on play action on that third drive, sacked on third and three. Again, the entire Washington front four beats the offensive line. Jones has no one to throw to. You know, the fourth drive that ended, you know, with their set with that field goal, you know, nice mix of run and pass. Jones, you know, going to Shepard like he usually does, um, you know, getting Saquon involved in the passing game. Then, you know, uses his legs and he breaks that, you know, what looked to be a 58-yard run, gets pulled back you know, for offensive holding down the field, overthrow, you know, Galladay drops a slant in the red zone and then Jones overthrows him. They dink and dunk with Shepard. They have to settle for a field goal. I mean, at the half, Jones is eight of 11 for 65 yards. He's got five carries for 74 leading the team. He has one, you know, has the the touchdown run. He has zero turnovers. I mean, the three sacks aside, and that to me, that's more on the offensive line being unable to contain that Washington pass rush then, you know, Jones holding the ball too long. And like I said, the coverage downfield, um, <coughs> solid. His receivers were locked in. He had no one to throw to. Overall, he's played a solid first half. But I do think that, like, they need to come out with the same, you know, play up, play, you know, up tempo, no huddle, you know, get the ball moving, force the tempo, dictate the tempo to, you know, not let Washington get its defense settled. And, Anthony, I got to tell you, the Giants' defense has looked – uh, as bad tonight as they did against Denver, and it's not a good sign, man. Yeah, I mean, you think about it like this. Uh, Taylor, Hen- Taylor Henneke, who was starting it um, in place of Ryan Fitzpatrick, 17-21 in the first half for 162 yards. I mean, that's literally um, a QBR rating of, 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 what, over 100, 118, actually, to be exact. That's a rating, um, yeah. Yeah, look at it like this. The pass flush is not there. They, got, they were able to get a sack on the opening drive. Uh, o- Ojalari, who I-, I thought the Jets was going to pick in uh, yeah. in April's draft, actually got his second sack. He has both of the Giants' two sacks so far in two games this season, which tells you a lot about what's going on and the lack of a pass rush, particularly Leonard Williams, uh, not yeah, really doing, not doing a-, a whole lot. But again, that secondary is a big problem, and, and the Giants' inability to get off the field on long drives. Against Denver, they gave up seven of fifteen for on uh, those on third down conversion. They gave up long drives, and, and again tonight they got onto a great start defensively, just like they did against Denver. But then they gave up uh, consecutive long drives of 10, 12, 12 uh, plays tonight. They gave up a ten yard touch, a ten yard uh, ten play scoring drive, and a twelve play scoring drive. Of course, they gave up the scoring drive in the uh, final two minutes of, of the half. For whatever reason, there was a lot of miscommunication going on in that second day. Uh, yeah. McLaren is, it got six catches with 60 yards. He's been talking it seven times. He's, he's uh, they, Bradbury yeah, alive. He, yeah, they, 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 yeah, they, they, you, they're giving Bradbury some, some help uh, now in the secondary. But still, all too often, that two-deep zone, you're seeing guys over the middle get, running wide open. 
And then it's just up to Hennigan to basically get the ball out of his hands a lot quicker. And once he's starting to do that, he's getting some momentum. And he's been able to move the team, the Washington football team downfield. They're doing a better job of stopping the run. He gave up 165 yards against Denver. Tonight, only 40 yards in the first half. So they're doing a good job up front and stopping the run. But now, again, a lack of a pass rush. Guys getting guys running free downfield. It's becoming a problem again. I mean, yeah, I mean, if you think about this, Jerry Judy had was on track for a hundred yard game before his ankle injury on, yeah. on Sunday. So in the second half, they're gonna have to bring more pressure out of the secondary, but unfortunately, Agreed. that is exposing a defensive backfield that is just not on the same page right now. I mean, and I would can, say what I mean, here's the thing, and Rabbi, I'll, I'll give you the, the ball in a second here. And this is what jumps out at me is that. They, for the second week in a row, I mean, granted it's only six quarters in, but they have allowed two guys who the title of journeyman quarterback really applies in Bridgewater against Denver, though Teddy's been, you know, slightly above that when he's gotten the chance. And Heineke, they've made them look like, you know, Peyton Manning in his heyday, you know, literally shredding the Giants secondary. So, you know, and this was the, the side of the ball that was supposed to keep the Giants in the game, Rabbi. This is, this is concerning, man. You don't have to give me the ball. Y'all both basically said everything about the game so far. Uh, I would say this about the Giants. They looked, re- again, they looked really good on the first drive. That's the best I've seen them look this season by far. Until the penalty that knocked it, and then combine that with the sack that knocked them out of field goal range, they could have easily had 10 to 14 points in those first two drives. They don't adjust in game at all. The only and thing I was happy to see. Garrett. And to me, that falls, falls on, on Garrett, Garrett but I would also say there are some. I, I, Judge has been a very good, has been a very good motivating leader so far. Has said all the right things, but he, this team just needs something in game. They need to have something in that second half because yeah, you know what? In, 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 right now, the- hold on, hold on. Yeah. I think right now. The Giants are a good team. They have pieces. They have enough to at least contend for a division crown. But right now, they just look lost at times. Yeah. And there's and, I, and I'll say this, but and I'll, I'll say this, and I agree with Dan Olaski. The Giants' offense looks very predictable, Boring. particularly when Daniel Boring. Jones dropped back, because. You can only tell he's going to drop back and pass when he takes six steps back and, and you know deep into the pocket. It's almost yeah. like okay, if I see it, if a, a TV analyst see it, and you see it, I'm quite sure Chase Young and company sees it also. So it's like it was. It's almost like as, that first, yeah, that that first drive. As it was they said, them around, as, it was said. The pocket. Yeah. as it was said, yeah. Dan Olavsky said. I really enjoy watching tape of film and then I get to the Giants and I want to basically blow my brains out. That's essentially what he said. Yeah, we man. have to move on and let he that did. second half play out. All right. The Jets, they are, I actually were kind of impressed with them in this game. So even though Jets quarterback Zach Wilson looked pretty good under center, just like a young Amy Santiago using her knowledge to make her way around the 9-9 to become captain, the Jets had a season opening loss to Carolina. I'm detecting a theme here. <laughs> yeah, I think you noticed. The Jets had a season opening loss to Carolina, nineteen to fourteen. Let's examine and look ahead. Jay, yes, punch the numbers and tell me what went wrong in the Week One loss. Well, I'll tell oh, you what went right in the Week One yeah. loss. I'll tell saying. you what went right needs to continue against New England, and that's Zach Wilson's second half. I mean, let's get this out of the way, and Anthony's going to dive into it a little more than I'm going to. So the Jets' offensive line is flat out awful right now, and Zach Wilson is set up to pay a David Carr-like price for it. For those of y'all too young to remember, David is the older brother of Raiders quarterback Derek Carr, and as the starting quarterback for the Houston Texans in their very first season in 2002. He set an NFL record getting sacked 76 times. I'm hoping Wilson will not get anywhere close to that number, but he's not. He was. Or just, by the way, kids, if you want to, if you want to say, if you want to say, think Joe Burrow and anybody who gets injured every single year behind the quarterback. So there's a lot of good modern day examples. There there you go. All right. Wilson's not off to a great start though, guys. He was sacked six times on Sunday, hit 11 other times, and he was under pressure on 40% of of his dropbacks and showed in the first half against Carolina where he was six of 16 for 84 yards and an interception. 
Connor Hughes, uh, the athletic beat writer for the Jets, put it best. And here's the quote. The Jets can't hide behind blissful ignorance any longer. This front five is a disaster. Wilson was lucky to leave Bank of America Stadium with his head still attached to his shoulders. Well written. I wish I had written it myself. With that being said, guys, Wilson's second half was a complete 180. 14 of 21, 174 yards and two scores. That's a passer rating of 123.9. Both of those scores went to to Corey Davis, who caught five balls for 97 in his first game as the Jets' number one wide receiver. The first TD pass showed Wilson's ability to make plays off schedule and showed the chemistry that he and Davis have developed. The second touchdown pass was off a well-run route, something I noted that Davis um, – was known for, and it was a good, you know, that was a good quality he had coming over when the Jets picked him up, and a perfectly placed throw, which showed Wilson's confidence in his own ability to put the ball where he wants to, even when the passing window is tight. Jets linebacker C.J. Mosley was impressed with his rookie quarterback. The quote is, number two is going to win us a lot of games. Yeah, if the offensive line can keep the kid on his feet, they can. And if they can, you know, more full games that look like that second half against Carolina are possible. If not, Two words, guys, 76 sacks. Just saying. <laughs> Two words, guys, five games. That's all he's going to play before he gets injured. I wow. almost have, wow. I, I have I with a bold prediction. Anthony, wrote, note the date and time. If it doesn't happen, we get to go back at him about it. Yeah, nice. Six, 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 six games. Six, six games. That's fine. By the way, let's not note the date and time. Let's just talk about what went wrong for the Jets. Yeah, you know, you know what? Uh, Robert Robert Salas, oh, post game, great story. The anniversary. And I don't know if you saw that um or that feature. Great story. Uh, the Jets had a great game plan, and Carolina, just like the Pontiac Bandit, decided to um wreck everything at the very last moment. Look, Zach Wilson is a, a tough kid because he took a beating on Sunday. If you didn't watch the game and you looked at his stat numbers, 237, 258 yards, two touchdowns, one interception, great game, right? And Jay mentioned the six sacks. One of them, by the way, he got hit and had his head slammed into the Oh, tunnel, my God. Which was a very really scary bounce. If you was watching, a scary moment yeah. for Jeff fans, for the, the team, and just for Zach Wilson himself. But think about how many sacks could have been if he didn't if he was able to be a little more mobile and avoid some. George Fan, who started at right tackle over Morgan Moses, just, you know what? Bless the bless the guy's heart, but he was just he just got to take it to the woodshed. I mean, the Jets' offensive line was really bad all game long. The running game didn't exactly do much neither. I mean, you look at the the backfield: Tevin Coleman, Ty Johnson, Michael Carter. I mean, none, none of those guys were effective, and that's what happens when you can't open up holes for your running backs to actually do any, to get any uh, traction as far as a running game. But you think about this too, and and, and, and by the way, Makai Beckton is gone for several weeks. Yeah. So that is a huge blow to an already bad offensive line. And, and people and people question why the Chicago not start Justin Fields right at the gate. Well, when you have Aaron Donald across from you and a bad offensive line, you probably don't want to get your rookie quarterback killed in week one. And thankfully, Zach Wilson made it out in one piece. He can, he lived to fight another day. But look, the Jets are going to have to do something as far as game planning, as far as play calling to move the pocket yep. around and yep. give the quarterback a little time to find guys downfield. Look, he was just 6 of 16 in the first half. A part of it was because he was running for his dear life. Yeah. Uh, for the majority of it, when he was able to get time, he was able to find guys, especially particularly in the fourth quarter and almost in that comeback. So the the Jets has got to find a way to just be able to move him around, give him some rollouts, maybe call a few screens, take the pressure off Wilson, have him drop five to seven steps into the pocket and not get creamed in the process. Yeah. Rabbi, they get the right, they get the Patriots. Yeah, 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 yeah. Can I, can I get my own thing in, guys? I don't know. You were frozen on my screen for a second there. I got a little worried. Switching the numbers. (laughs) Yeah, well, I'm going to tell you now. We're talking about America. Now, the Jets in week two have America's newest star, who has a body type like Cheddar in Mac Jones and the Patriots coming in. Um, Okay. Body types like Cheddar. Wow. Yes. Cheddar the dog. He's in red. New England Patriots, their running game 
is a strength. Was seen as a strength going into the season, but in their week one loss to the Dolphins, they just had some brutal fumbles. Ramondre Stevenson turned the ball over earlier, and then Damian Harris had a huge fumble in the red in the fourth quarter that pretty much led to the win for the Miami Dolphins uh, with about like three minutes left to go. And their running back coach basically said that gave, that gave the damn game away. For our team. Brutal words. Harris coming out of Alabama had a pretty good rookie season, was meant to be a bell cow for this team in 2021. I have him in two fantasy leagues, I would know. However, the one thing that Bill Belichick preaches is ball security. So yeah. there might be more of a chance that we're going to see a little bit of their uh, other running back, J.J. Taylor, in the mix. They're going to go on old, reliable James White to kind of mix it up a little bit. He actually might get more carries. What Matt Jones needs to do depends on the running game. There's still receivers that outside of Nelson Aguilar and Kendrick Bourne, you have no idea who is on this team so pump the brakes on the new england patriots are easily going to win the division or are easily going to make the playoffs because belichick has found the savior yet that's not true mac played very well in that opening game but if you don't have a running game you're not going to win these games late because a lot of these teams are pretty damn good and just watch out if new england can't get to the jets on sunday this might actually be a very close game. You're going to need ball control late. This is a rivalry game. This is a division game. This is one I think the Jets think they can get. I think it's a winnable game. Tom Brady's on the other side of that team. On the other side of that a lot of scrimmage. Uh, Rabbi, I got to ask who who outside of Foxborough and you know the the north you know uh, up in that you know New England area is saying that you know that the Patriots have found the next Tom Brady or a shoe in a lot of, <laughs> a lot of people out there in, a lot of people in 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 your media have said that the, the Patriots have found their uh-huh. next savior right. no one is actually questioning Mac Jones I don't think Mac unless Mac starts going on a little bit of a bad run here. I don't think Mac is going to get the benefit of the doubt like he would, like a Daniel Jones right now is getting criticized in the- Well, you're lucky. Look, as you said, it's one game. You guys know that I'm I'm high on Jones. You know, I went through his tape. I went through his, his stuff when we were doing our draft show. And I thought he was going to be, I think he has all the makings of being a, a solid to above, above solid NFL quarterback. Um, you know, I think I don't think any of the any of the moments are too big for him. He showed his That's ability. That's a big thing. That, and it's a big thing. Huge thing. Far repl- I mean, forget about Cam Newton. He's a New England fan base is looking at him as replacing Tom Brady. Newton was the bridge. Yeah. They all knew that. And he looked. He made good, good. He made good decisions. He made the right throws. He showed that he can grasp an NFL offense. He can read an NFL defense. Look, the big thing is we know is like. Where is he, you know, where, where, how are we going to be talking about him when we get like past week four and, you know, there's a book that's been developed on him and defensive coordinators adjust to how he, how he, you know, goes about his progressions, how he makes his throws, how he reacts to things and how does he react to that? So it'll be interesting to see where he's at and where the Patriots are at by, you know, by the first quarter poll of the season. Good start. They didn't get the win, but, you know, good start for him. So, but it's going to be interesting on Sunday. And rookie quarterbacks and rookie quarterbacks don't win in year in their first game. And we they saw don't. that three of them lost this week. Although the other two Alabama quarterbacks, Jalen Hurts and uh, Tua, both won. And Jalen, if you had the book on Jalen last season, this season that book has been both thrown of them around. Connected with their Alabama wide receiver teammates for touchdowns. <laughs> and Jalen Smith actually connected in his first touchdown where he caught. The past the one in the next versus All right. Moving on. Finally tonight, just like Anthony, anytime he sees Rosa Diaz on the screen, there were some overreactions for week one. If these overreactions stick, then we're technically wrong and we can't win. So Anthony, let's start with you with your winless points, because it's 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 a loose lose situation either <laughs> way. Yeah, you know, pretty much. Uh, my overreaction is simply Jimmy Garoppolo is going to be an MVP candidate. Ooh. In fact, 
yeah, without question. You think about this, we forget because Trey Lance came in with such flair. And, and, and the fact that, but what, 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 uh, uh, what have you done for me lately, society, and what have you done for me lately, league? We forgot Jimmy Garoppolo was a quarterback who played in the Super Bowl just two years ago. And a guy yeah, who was fine. a better quarterback when he was healthy. Look, the first snap, he fumbled, he fumbled the opening snap against Detroit, and Twitter went absolutely nuts. And it was really to run him out of, out of the Bay Area. And all he did was finish 17, uh, completed 8 for 8, and his first, um, first 10 uh, completions, finished with 314 yards, one touchdown, 124 uh, quarterback rating, and a game that his defense couldn't try hard enough to give away in the fourth quarter. You put up 41 points in any, on any NFL team, it's an accomplishment. But to do it in week one, and with a quarterback who missed most of last season with injury and had a basically shell stats on the preseason with the rookie sensation, who, by the way, came in for a couple of trick gadget plays, do a, 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 a couple of no, gadget plays. And I'm looking at it like this. At Garoppolo, at this time, he's actually a pretty accurate quarterback. He's a guy that that – New England was was kind of salivating for because they were under the impression that Tom Brady was going to retire sooner than later, only to trade him away. And then he helped Sac- San Francisco get to um get to the Super Bowl two years ago. Look, with that defense, if the defense played back to the 2019 form, um, they could get to the they could get back to the playoffs and and deep into the postseason run. But Jimmy Garoppolo, look, I think he can put up a great season. I think guys, people are ready to run him out of town right away. I think he's going to, this is his season to prove everyone wrong that it's ready to just hand the mantle down to last by the gate. I think he's going to finish with at least 20 to 25 touchdowns, maybe 30. And think about this, Montana Rice, Young Rice, Garoppolo. uh, Evo Samuel's healthy. Yeah. And think about this. (laughs) Garoppolo to Samuel, think about that combination because that was a good combination Sunday. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm just Hold thinking. On. Hmm. Hold on. Hey, look, we're talking about overreactions here, so don't don't kill don't kill. Five, Five four, three, two, <laughs> one. It was the Lions. Jesus. Hey. <laughs> It was the Lions. Rabbi, if you're going to let baby. us overreact, you have to let us go over the top with the overreaction. Very, the over, whole point of the very show. over the top. Anyway, Jay's got to more over the top bird. Yeah, here we go. I have an over the top overreaction, and I'm going to end with an I told you so. So stick around for that. Um, Aaron, here's my overreaction. Aaron Rodgers has washed up. His career is over. Let's face it, guys. That was one of the worst games he's ever played, okay? 15 of 28 for 133 yards, zero touchdowns, two picks. That's a 53.8 completion percentage and a 36.8 passer rating from a quarterback who led the NFL in both last year, 70.7 completion percentage and a passer rating of 121.5. The reigning NFL MVP was completely outplayed by Jameis Winston and looked utterly lost against the Saints defense. Those two interceptions, he threw five all of last year, were absolutely awful. They weren't tipped, nor were they 50-50 balls that the Saints defense just managed to come away with. They were flat-out bad decisions, poorly executed. Type of throws you're more inclined to expect from Winston than Rodgers. <clears throat> Did Rodgers and the Packers think all they had to do is show up since this was a Saints team that was displaced by Hurricane Ida, no longer had Drew Brees at quarterback, and was playing without star wide receiver Michael Thomas. In the postgame presser, Rodgers admitted that the back may have been a little too full of themselves coming into the season off their NC- NFC Championship game appearance and all the preseason Super Bowl hype. Here's the quote. Yeah, I think so. I think there's probably some of that. We probably felt like we were – going to go up and down on, on the um, up and down the field on whoever they had out there and that obviously wasn't the case today. You think? <laughs> they had I mean they had only two pass plays go for more <coughs> than 20 yards. Their longest run was 8 yards and Rodgers can talk all he wants about being thrown off by 
how the Saints defense really didn't come after him, electing to use a Rams-like, you know, two-shell defense to keep everything in front of them to prevent any big plays, forcing Green Bay to beat them by running the ball and show, you know, throwing short passes, which obviously didn't work. Um, you know, the, the pack only ran for 43 yards on 15 carries. That's 2.9 a carry. And Rodgers averaged only 4.7 yards per pass attempt. They struggled to put together intermediate games through the air. They were one for 10 on third down. Only two of the seven drives that Rodgers directed lasted more than six plays. If this is any indication of who Rodgers will be this season, then this really should be his last one in cheesehead country because he's done. Never thought I'd say these words, but Aaron Rodgers needs to show me something on Sunday. Against who, the rabbi? Against who? I need you to say it again in that tone of voice. It was the Lions! Thank you. Jesus. Right, That'll I be on Monday, it, actually, but... <laughs> Monday night, right? It'll be on Monday. There you go. The Lambo crowd's going to be loud, and if Rodgers doesn't come to play, they're going to let him know it. All right, here's my I told you so before I turn the ball over to Rabbi. Um, the Titans struggled badly on offense in their 38-13 loss to the Cardinals. I said on our kickoff show that losing Arthur Smith as their play caller could have as much of a negative effect as losing any of their star players. I said that Todd Downing's last gig as an offensive coordinator with the Raiders, the Raiders, did not go well. And he did not get off to a good start in week one as the Titan offense allowed six sacks and turned it over three times. Yes, Rabbi, I know. Arthur Smith did not have a good game. And his yeah, game you can't you can't do what I told you so after that performance. Hey, 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 all I'm saying you know the Titans, all, all I'm saying is that in the vacuum that is the Tennessee Titans offense, and that's all I'm going off here. I told you guys on the kickoff show the Titans could possibly be in trouble losing Smith as a play caller. The guy was creative, the guy knew how to put those guys in the right spots to make them successful. And the fact that he's not there and his style and his his imaginativeness, his creativity is not there. That's going to be a problem if Todd Downing repeats the way he was as a Raider offensive coordinator. Just saying. Your ball. Well, well, by the way, one of your other reaction overreactions with the Houston Texans are going to win the AFC South. And the way you're acting like that, that may not be as much of an overreaction anymore. <laughs> this was a weekend for second chances. Sam Darnold decided <laughs> to give the ball to Christian McCaffrey 30 times and hey, looked like him a completely he different player. And he went to Robbie Anderson. So he, he went to people who are trust. Matthew Stafford looked like a championship caliber quarterback. Teddy Bridgewater looked like an MVP. Tyrod Taylor looked amazing in the backfield. It almost looked like Sean Paulson. <laughs> However, the one person who has reignited his career and will lead the Saints to a very good season is Jameis Winston, the person that Jay just mentioned. 14 of 20 for 148. That's right. He didn't throw for a lot of yards. He didn't have to because the Saints basically took their foot and put it on the Packers' throat for the entire game. No Michael Thomas, but Jameis just had a had a huge had a lot of weapons on offense, and most importantly, has learned under Sean Payton and Drew Brees, and that's allowed him to kind of do what he's doing right now. But the one thing that impresses me is this: it happened in the fourth quarter when the game was 31 to three. So I don't know if this is really a great stat. He threw a ball for 50 plus yard for a 50 plus yard touchdown, something that Drew Brees had never done in New Orleans, which is kind of amazing. And also kind of amazing when you realize that that was almost half of the 148 yards yeah. that Jameis Winston threw hey, for. There was never any doubt so, right that Jameis has the arm strength. His decision. Oh, Jameis does the arm strength tremendously, and I'm, we're, it's going to be very interesting to see throughout the year if he can manage to cut the interceptions. It's been a thing that has been rattled in everyone's head. Cut the interceptions. Cut the interceptions. Even if he throws one a game over the next 16, that's better than he's done in his in for most of his career. It'll be half of his 30 for 30 season. And no, I'm not talking about the Mets that's a 30 documentary. For 30. I'm talking about <laughs> uh, but if this continues. New Orleans could not only be a playoff team, they could challenge Tampa Bay for the NFC South, which technically they are the defending division champions of. So, By the way, Val, watch Val, out, you, world. Yeah, James Winston's thought, um, coming. 
Yeah, did you find out a policy application to James Wilson that was getting passed around social media? This yes. Week? Yes, the James Winston apology form. It's all. It's it's very good, but we still have 16 games to go. I saw my a lot of things two, can I, change. I signed the first two letters to my first name. Let me get to the, to the rest of the season before I sign it completely on a dotted line. Look, Winston, if you can cut down the turnovers in half, the Saints are all, all a, a, let me, 11 to 12 win team without question. Let me just say this right now. It's a big difference playing for an easier going guy who allows you to do more and Sean Payton than a guy who is kind of a little more of a control freak who only the god Tom Brady yeah. can calm down in Bruce Arians and I think that was a bad mix and it helped James out. Oh yeah 100 <laughs> percent I mean you and I Rabbi we you know we've talked about this ad nauseum it doesn't matter what your skill set is as a quarterback if you're <clears throat> if your skill set doesn't either a match the system you're in or B, you know, match the coach that you're dealing with, it's not going to be a good mix. Um, and I think, you know, after spending a year studying under Drew Brees and learning how that offense works and soaking up Brees' knowledge and, you know, seeing how Sean Payton operates, and he, you're right, he's a completely different – he's as good an offensive tactician as there is in the NFL, and we all know that, you know, his, he, he is – he's all about getting into a groove and working up a rhythm with his own – with his quarterback – and I think this will – I was always surprised last year when Taysom Hill got so much more playing time on the games where Drew couldn't play, and that may have had a, something to do with him knowing the offense better at that point. But Probably I think you know, Winston has shown that, you know, he's picked up the offense. He's had a full offseason, a full training cramp. So uh, I think he earned that spot. And I think playing for Sean Payton in this offense, whether he has Michael Thomas or not, he still has Alvin Kamara. Um, and that Saints defense, which doesn't get talked about enough, I think it'll be a good fit and could very much. You talk about second chances, Rabbi. This could very well resurrect Winston's career. Hey, look, I say it like this: a forty-yard starter. Yeah, I say it like this: a forty-yard sprint in the middle of hell is easier than being a quarterback under Bruce Arians. So I think Jim is Wilson uh, getting a career of reso- an opportunity for a career of resurgence in New Orleans. Um, maybe one of the better stories of this season, if. The Saints are able to continue that that um that high that, know, sorry that guys high level play. Daniel, but that Daniel, Darius yeah, Slayton right there. Right there. Sorry to interrupt you, man, but Daniel I, I Jones saw... just went up top on a, uh, connecting with Darius Slayton on a big big yeah. down throw. I, I All right, I'm watching on delay here, so that's I just uh, react to see you guys. Speaking of watching on delay, let's get out of here and watch. Thirty-three it yards time. touchdown. So we're we're at, we're going to leave while the Giants are on a high note. Is that what we're doing here? Yes. All right, I'm down with that. For Jay Kaplan and Anthony Strait, I'm Stephen Rabinowitz. Find us on that social media thing, facebook.com slash on the sports lines to watch live, youtube.com slash on the sports lines on demand, at O-N-T-H sports lines for the link to this show and fun articles that we find get posted. One one more on the sports lines. The name of our sex tape. Yay! One more, uh, one more. Title of our sex. Oh, no, 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 no. All right. Let, yes. let, let, before we wrap up, one last thing, because we need to leave on a better note than that. Did any of you guys watch Red Zone on Sunday? Did you catch the rendition of the national anthem? Very nice. It was a very yes. moving. It was very moving. I posted it on, uh, on Twitter and all over the place. If you can, find it on YouTube. Um, the woman who sang it um, her, lost her father on, on, on 9-11, um, and she sung it from the memorial standing next to where her father's name is etched into it with a flat little flag on top of it. As I said on my post, if you didn't get a little choked up, you're not human. That was a hell of a way to start uh, the first Sunday of the NFL season. No, I it did. Very, so very I will say that it was a beautiful rendition and I recommend those of you are watching to uh, look that up on our YouTube yeah, page. On YouTube. Uh, I mean, yeah. it's, it's just a beautiful, uh, beautiful moment. All right, guys, uh, that does it for this show. We will see you again next time. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone.